So we have three very special speakers this morning. We're going to start off with Ira Halfand, who's from the International Physicians for the Prevention of Nuclear War. Um, is in, uh, got a lot of expertise on the issue of the climatic consequences of nuclear weapons and has been undergoing a, a series of very successful speaking engagements around the world, including an incredible one in Israel recently. Um, he's going to give us a start off, and then after that we'll hear from Francois Stam from the ICRC delegation for the United States and Canada, and Brad Gutierrez uh, from the American Red Cross. Uh, of course we've got a PowerPoint presentation, Francois, I may ask you just to move over there a little bit, and we can move to the side also. Um, Ira, the floor is yours. Good morning. Uh, thank you, uh, Alan, for your, that uh, introduction, and thank you to PNND for inviting me to be part of your meeting here today. There was a lot of uh, conversation uh, over yesterday about the the new humanitarian consequences focus of, of efforts to eliminate nuclear weapons, and so I thought it would be appropriate this morning to actually discuss what the humanitarian consequences are. I suspect that for many of you this is not new information, um, but I have found in uh, a lot of meetings over many years that it is almost always worthwhile to re-emphasize what's actually going to happen if nuclear weapons are used because even those of us who know this material and know what's going to happen uh, for the most part tend to partition this off in our brains. We put it off in a corner, make it inaccessible to our daily thinking and, and it's understandable this is very very painful information and it's hard to keep in mind but that's exactly what we need to do and it's exactly what we need to make the leaders of the nuclear weapon states do. They need to be thinking about this consciously every day. What is going to happen if these weapons are used? So let me uh, just briefly uh, go through uh, some of the more recent and important findings about nuclear weapons consequences. I want to talk first about the new data on limited nuclear war. Uh, about five years ago, um, actually it's seven years ago now, uh, Alan Robach and Brian Toon published some studies on the climatic effects of a limited nuclear war. The scenario that they considered was a war in South Asia between India and Pakistan involving the use of about 50 relatively small Hiroshima-sized warheads on either side targeted at urban centers. Um, the immediate effects in South Asia are unbelievably catastrophic. 20 million people dead in the first week. Um, most of the major cities in the subcontinent are destroyed. Vast radioactive contamination throughout South Asia. But as appalling as these direct effects in South Asia are, it is the global climate impact that really demands our attention. What happens when you have 100 cities burning is that an enormous amount of soot is lofted high up into the atmosphere where it blocks out the sunlight and drops temperatures across the planet and that in turn leads to very significant declines in precipitation. Uh, the drop in temperature is about 1.3 degrees centigrade and it is maintained for a full decade under this scenario. To put that in context, the blue line on this graph shows all of the global warming that has taken place in the last 130 years, which demands so much attention across the globe. And the red line on the right of this slide shows the change in temperature that takes place over three days in response to this limited war in South Asia. An enormous uh, and, and uh, sustained impact that lasts for a full decade. Uh, this is a difficult slide to look at. I just put it up briefly. It shows the actual change in the growing season that results from this. When the temperatures are cooler, uh, there are frosts later into the spring and frosts earlier in the, in the fall. The growing season is shortened. And as you can see, in the interior regions, particularly of major continents, the growing seasons are shortened by anywhere from 20 to 30 days, which, as we will see, has catastrophic effects on food production. In addition, there is a very significant decline in precipitation. As the atmosphere cools, less water is evaporated from the oceans to fall back as rain or snow. And so, again, we see here, this is for the summer months in the Northern Hemisphere of the first year after this limited nuclear war, precipitation falling by up to 40 to 50 percent in many important food growing areas. Um, we are, at this point in time, uh, not exactly sure what happens to food supply worldwide, but we've been able to look at a number of crops. We looked at corn in the United States, the world's largest producer of corn, and found that production goes down about 12% for a full decade. 
Uh, it, it is worse in the fifth year after the nuclear war in South Asia when it goes down by a full uh, 20 percent. We looked at rice production in China, the world's largest producer of rice. Rice production there uh, goes down about 15 percent for a full decade. In the first years after the war, it goes down much more than that, about, uh, again, uh, 20 to 25 percent. Um, in some provinces in China, there is a complete failure of the rice crop. This is a, a graph showing what happens in Heilongjiang in the northeast of China. Uh, in the first year after this nuclear war, uh, there is a complete failure of the crop. No rice is produced. Heilongjiang is home to 35 million people. Um, at this moment in time, we are very ill-prepared <coughs> to deal with the decline in food production of this magnitude. World grain reserves amount to only about 70 days of consumption. And that means that these reserves would very rapidly be exhausted uh, trying to deal with these food shortages. In addition, at baseline today, there are 870 million people who are malnourished. These people are receiving on average about 1,800 calories a day, which is just enough to maintain their body mass and enable them to do a very limited amount of work. All of these people would be at risk in a situation where major food crops around the world decline by 10 to 15 percent. Um, and we concluded based on this in a report that we released almost two years ago um, that up to a billion people worldwide would be at risk of famine. The 870 million people who are malnourished at baseline and another 300 million people who get adequate food today but live in countries that are highly dependent on food imports. Now since that report came out we've been able to do some additional look, uh, research on food production in China. And I would draw your attention just to the bottom line on this chart. Uh, we had looked previously at rice production. The new study confirmed about a 15% decline in rice production. Um, but what we, actually a little bit higher, it's about a 17% in the new study. But what was really startling was what happens to wheat production. Wheat is the second largest grain crop in China. It is just behind rice. It is the main staple for the entire northern part of uh, the country. And wheat production goes down by a staggering 31% for a full decade. In the first five years after this war, it goes down by 39%. Based on this, we have had to, I think, revise our estimate of what the global impact of this would be. Because the initial figure that a billion people worldwide would face famine assumed that China was relatively spared that China would be able to feed its people. That is now in question. And so we now have to consider the possibility that another 1.3 billion people in China will also be at risk. Uh, at the very least, we will be looking at a decade of profound economic and social chaos in China, uh, the world's largest country, the world's second largest economy, the world's most dynamic economy. And the implications for the entire world of this are enormous. This most recent study about wheat production also raises the question about what happens to wheat production elsewhere in the world. We've looked at China. What happens to wheat in the United States? What happens to wheat in Canada, in Australia, in the European Union, in Ukraine, in Kazakhstan, in Russia? If there are similar declines in wheat production in these countries, and we haven't looked at it yet, but there's no reason to think it would be different than the situation in China, then the same incredible food insecurity is going to occur in all of these areas. And the situation may be far worse even than we are talking about. So what is the, what is the, the significance of this? Uh, what we are finding is that even a very limited use of nuclear weapons has the capacity to kill perhaps a billion to two billion people over the course of a decade. This is an event unprecedented in human history. Uh, I think it almost certainly would mean the end of modern civilization as we know it. Uh, we, we've seen recently what happened to the world economy just as a response to a little housing bubble here in the United States. You know, a global depression that's lasted now for six years. The impact of this kind of, of devastating economic and, and human suffering uh, is going to wreak havoc throughout the world. Um, this obviously has huge implications for nuclear weapons policy. We now have to understand that it is not just the weapons, the arsenals of the large nuclear powers that threaten the entire world, but even the smaller nuclear arsenals of India, Pakistan, of Israel, uh, are capable of causing worldwide problems. And this has implications for our, the way we approach things. 
in these countries. It also, though, has huge implications for the nuclear weapons policy of the major powers, because in this scenario, uh, we looked at what happens in a war between India and Pakistan, but each U.S. Trident submarine carries 96 warheads, can carry them, each of which is 10 to 30 times more powerful than the bombs we used in this scenario based on South Asia. That means that each U.S. Trident submarine can create this nuclear famine scenario many times over. And the United States has 14 of them, and that's just one leg of the U.S. nuclear triad. The Russian arsenal has the same, I mean, literally insane degree of overkill capacity. So let's look for just a minute at what happens if their arsenals are used. Um, and we are told by the United States and Russia and the rest of the P5 that we don't really need to worry about this, that nuclear war between the, the major nuclear powers is, is off the table. It's not going to happen. I think that assurance is, is much uh, less reassuring given the events of the last year. I mean, we've seen U.S. and Russian warships shadowing each other in a hostile environment in the eastern Mediterranean during the Syrian crisis. We see the, the very dangerous crisis developing now in Ukraine. The possibility of the U.S. and Russia coming into conflict cannot be dismissed out of hand. <laughs> but even if there's not a deliberate, intentional use of nuclear weapons, there remains, as Eric Schloss's new book has so powerfully illustrated, the very real and present danger that there will be an accidental use of these weapons that could go on to trigger a large-scale nuclear war. So let's look at that for a minute. I want to start by talking about a large-scale attack on one city. I'm going to use New York, a city which I assume is familiar to many of you. Um, we don't know exactly what Russian targeting strategy is, but conversations I've had with a number of experts on both sides suggest that among the targets in New York that almost certainly would be hit are a number of, of obvious places the uh, financial and administrative centers at Wall Street and Midtown, the, the major airports, uh, Newark, LaGuardia, Kennedy, uh, the three major bridges that link the New York metropolitan area together, the Verrazano Bridge, the Washington, uh, George Washington Bridge, and the Throgs Next Bridge, and also the large uh, industrial complex at the former Brooklyn Navy Yard. At each one of these nine target points, a fireball would form all right, let me just explain what happened here. Um, for the purpose of this scenario, I assumed that the weapons used were... Um, sorry. For the purpose of this scenario, I assumed that the weapons used were 300 kilotons in size. Russian arsenal has 100 kiloton weapons on their submarines, 400 and 800 kiloton weapons on their land-based missiles, so sort of a rough average of 300 kiloton explosion. At each one of these target points, a fireball would form in the first thousandth of a second that would reach out for approximately three quarters of a kilometer, kilometer and a half across. Within this area, the temperature would rise to 20 million degrees, and everything would vaporize. The buildings, the trees, the people, the upper level of the Earth itself would simply disappear. It would vaporize to a distance of four kilometers in every direction. The explosions would generate winds in excess of 500 kilometers per hour and blast pressures greater than 10 psi. Forces of this magnitude will level wooden buildings, masonry buildings. A modern steel and concrete building like this would see the walls, the floors, the ceilings swept down. A steel skeleton would be left, that's all. To a distance of some 10 kilometers in every direction, the heat would be so intense that everything flammable would burn. Wood, paper, cloth, gasoline, heating oil, it would all ignite. And over the course of the next half hour, the hundreds of thousands of fires started by these nine explosions would coalesce into a giant firestorm. In the case of New York, it's about 25 by 40 kilometers, 960 square kilometers. Within this entire area showed by the red circles on this map, the temperature would rise to 800 degrees centigrade. All of the oxygen would be consumed, and every living thing would die. If this were part of a large-scale war between the United States and Russia, this level of destruction would be visited on every major metropolitan area in the United States, and in Russia. And if NATO were drawn into the conflict, every major city in Canada and Europe as well. 
a study that we did in back in 2002, looking at what would happen if only 300 warheads in the Russian arsenal got through to urban targets in the United States, showed that in the first half hour, 75 to 100 million people would die. In addition, the entire economic infrastructure of the country would be destroyed. All of the things that a modern industrial society requires to maintain its population. The public health system, the banking system, the transportation system, the communications network, the food distribution system, it would all be gone. And it is probable that in the months following this attack, the vast majority of the American, Russian, and European population would die from starvation, from radiation exposure, from exposure to cold. Uh, several hundred million people, perhaps as many as a billion people, as the direct consequences in the areas that were targeted. But again, the direct effects are not the worst part of the story. The worst part of the story involves the climate disruption. The war in South Asia scenario puts about 5 million tons of debris into the atmosphere and drops temperatures about 1.3 degrees centigrade. A war between the United States and Russia, using only those weapons which are available to them when New START is fully implemented in 2017, that war puts 150 million tons of debris into the atmosphere, and it drops global temperatures not 1.3 degrees, but 8 degrees centigrade. In the interior regions of North America and Eurasia, the temperature drop is 20 to 30 degrees centigrade. There have not been temperatures on this planet that cold in 18,000 years since the coldest point of the last ice age. And under these conditions, ecosystems across the world would collapse. There would, in the northern hemisphere, be three years without a single day free of frost, meaning all food production would stop. The vast majority of the human race would starve to death, and it is possible that we would become extinct as a species. Now, this is the danger that we face. And I think this, is, this information is a very powerful tool for us to use in making the case that nuclear weapons are too dangerous to keep on this planet. That all the fancy theories about deterrence really need to be thrown out because we cannot guarantee that these weapons will not be used as long as they exist. And this is what's going to happen if they are used. Thank you.